as we, <laughs> time is short, I talk too much. <laughs> uh, if we look at Psalm 82, it says it's a psalm of Asaph. We're familiar with Asaph. We've been looking at his psalms over the last several weeks. He was a worship leader within the, the congregation of the people of Israel under David. When it says it's a psalm, that just means that it was a psalm that was meant to be accompanied by stringed instruments. Uh, that, that designation is given to 57 different psalms. And so that gives you an idea of, of the way in which it was meant to be sung and how it was meant to be played. And this is a weird song. Uh, it, it starts out very familiar. Uh, it starts out just acknowledging who God is as the judge over all the earth. But then it begins to quote the supreme God of the universe. In verses 2 through 7, God is speaking and he's speaking about the injustices that are taking place on the earth. And, yeah, I was trying to think, what kind of song would we, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever sang a song like this. Certainly not within the, the, the corporate worship of God's people. I imagine this is probably a song very similar to what um, perhaps the slaves would have sang, you know, in our country. You know, let my people go. That type of, it was meant to be an encouragement and it certainly would have been for those who had experienced the injustices of wicked rulers and wicked people. As they sang, they would have been reminded there is an ultimate judge and that all of those who are dealing wickedly will be dealt with rightly. And it also would have been a rebuke to those who are judging unjustly. And so it's right, again, remember we mentioned last week, you know, some of the songs that we see in the Psalms are very different than what we tend to sing today because they cover the gamut of not only emotions but experience. And so as we look at this, number one, what we see in verse one is that God is identified as the judge. Uh, we read, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. This is the word Elohim, the supreme being, the creator of the universe. And he sets up court here. He's setting up in the midst of the congregation. We'll see who he's called to court. All right, but the idea here being that God is judge. And that's good for us to keep in the center and the forefront of our mind. God is our creator. God is our Lord. He's our savior. But he is judge and supreme over all his creation. Isaiah 33, 22 says, For the Lord is our judge. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 23, And to God, the judge of all. So there's no one who escapes the judge. In fact, Romans 14, 12 says, each of us shall give account of himself to God. That's good for us to think about. Each of us, all of us, every single one of us will one day stand before the God who made us and give an account. And here, God is calling this court into session you say well you know, who's this judgment directed at well in psalm 82 it's directed at the gods little g right and you say who in the world it says look verse one in the midst of the gods he holds judgment and then verse six he said i said you are gods sons of the most high all of you who's he talking about who are these gods right and and, and there's actually there's kind of a division there's a there's a divided thinking over who he's referring to uh, some would say that he's referring to demons or evil spirits here, fallen angels, uh, thinking of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, you know, principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, so there are those who would kind of say that these gods are fallen angels, and, and sometimes in Scripture, fallen angels are referred to in that way. Um, on the other side of it, there are those who would say that this psalm is referring to human rulers or human judges uh, and, and, and really the argument is based on passages like Exodus 21 and 22 when, get, when God established rulers and leaders over his people he called them gods with little g you say you know what is the point behind that why would God refer to them in that way because they were acting in his stead they had been appointed by God they were they were to to act in accordance with God's word uh, they were to be administrators of his justice and so they were to function as servants of the most high God and so they were referred to as God's little g just serving under his authority right uh, and, and I think it's important to remember that all leadership all government all authority has been established 
by God. Um, let, me, let me turn. You don't have to turn if you don't want. Romans 13. I'm going to look at the first four verses. And you can listen carefully. It says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So you hear that? All government, all authority instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So we see God's, God's the one who established government. He's the one who placed that authority for our good. All government was, was intended for that purpose. Now, what we see today is very much what we see happening here in Psalm 82. Right? As he's referring to these human leaders, and, and that's the, the way, that's the, that's the direction I tend to lean whenever I'm looking at this passage, as God is referring to human authority here when he talks about these little gods. The reason I lean that way is because Jesus actually quoted Psalm 82 in John chapter 10, referring to the leaders of Israel as gods. Right? John chapter 10 Verse 34, Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? Quoting Psalm 82, 6. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blasphemed because I said I am the Son of God? Right? Jesus was using this to say, if God called you gods, how much more so the Son of God? Right? So this that identification there. So we see primarily, number one, God is judge. But then we see in verse two that God is a just judge. Right? And there's a difference, right? There's a difference between a judge, just any judge, and a just judge. In verse two, it says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Right? So the, the idea here is pretty clear. There's a suggestion that those in leadership, those in government, were not ruling rightly. They were ruling unfairly. They were showing favoritism towards wickedness and evil. And God simply asked the question, how long? How long? And there's a, there's a musical notation there that we don't read, but it's meant to pause, right? Selah, reflect, stop. And this is really an opportunity as this question is asked. The, person, the, the purpose was to pause and consider the question. So as this is being sung and they hear, how long will you judge unjustly? Stop. <laughs> What's the point of this? The point is that they would see their wickedness and they would repent and they would turn of it. Right? Th that's the point here. Stop, pause, recognize your sin and turn away. He's going to tell them exactly what he wants them to do. <laughs> in verses 3 and 4, he says, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. This is God's plan and God's call for leadership to look out for those who are poor and needy, to care for those who are destitute, to take care of the defenseless. And God says, you're not doing it. Now, <laughs> what we have to understand is, is that the supreme God of the universe is in a unique place, in a unique position to judge, because he is just in all of his ways. When we think of this God, <laughs> understand that God always acts justly always acts impartially doing what is right he is the st he's the standard for what is right and so when we say that God judges impartially we just understand that God doesn't play favorites he doesn't look <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't look at one people with special favor over another people the word of God actually tells us in James 
chapter 2, or Romans chapter 2, verse 11, there is no partiality with God. God treats all peoples with favor and equity. And he does what is right. Romans, or Genesis chapter 18, 25, shall not the God of all the earth do that which is right? Not only does God not play favorites, but he always does right. Always. Listen to, listen to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 and 4. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. <laughs> a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. See, his word and his ways are the standard. He puts himself up and says, act in accordance with my word, my ways, my justice. And here he's asking the question, how long? How long will you act wickedly? How long will you act unjustly? How long will you abuse the poor and take advantage of those in need? Right? I mean, these are, these are leaders who take bribes. These are leaders who abuse those to, to gain more power, right? They abuse those who don't have the ability to defend themselves. And God says, how long will it go on? Now, failure to fulfill God's purpose has earth-shaking ramifications right you see it in verse 5 they have neither knowledge nor understanding they walk about in darkness all the foundations of the earth are shaking again there's there's a little bit of debate over who this they is is it the leaders the rulers or is it the weak and the needy and i think it's the weak and the needy right the rulers are abusing them and leaving those who are poor and in need and afflicted leaving them to walk in darkness Right? And, and all the foundations of the earth are shaken. <laughs> this is what happens when unjust rulers and unjust leaders, when their rule plays out. The entire foundations of our culture and our society are shaken. Not that God's not in control, right? But the effects on society are great, right? And people are in need and they're in darkness. And we have this picture here. But, thank the Lord, we see in verses 6 through 8, the just judge has the final say. God has the final word. He said in verse 6, I said you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. He says, I may have put you on your throne, but I could take you out. Right? That's the picture here. All of them are going to die like any other man. It doesn't matter how much power they have. It doesn't matter who they are. One day they're going to die. And it's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. Right? So one day, each one of us are going to take our last breath. And we're going to stand before God. And he's simply reminding these unjust rulers that they too will stand before the, the judge, the God of all the earth. It's interesting here, because in verses 2 through 7, God's been doing all the talking. And then we come to verse 8. And in verse 8, Asaph is going to respond to the word. He's going to respond to these truths that they've been singing about, that God is the judge, and he is a just judge, and he's ruling over all the earth, and he's calling for repentance, and he's calling for justice. And in response, what does Asaph say in verse 8? Arise, O God, judge the earth. What's he saying? We need your judgment. We need your justice. He's sick and tired of seeing the tyranny and the injustice and the abuse of power. And so he says, God, you judge. It's a prayer, right? He says, God, th this is the right response, right? This is, this is exactly what we're told to pray in the model prayer, right? In, in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Right, thy will be done. Right, this is the heart behind that very thing. There is a God who rules and reigns over all the universe, and we want his rule and reign. This, when you pray that, your kingdom come, you're praying first and foremost, God, I want you to rule and reign in my life, in my heart. 
And then you're praying, God, I want you to rule and reign in the hearts and lives of others. It's a missional prayer. In my family, <laughs> in my nation, in the world, we want you to rule and reign in the hearts and lives of all peoples. And ultimately, it's a prayer that God would come, right? <laughs> As we sang, <laughs> come, Oh God, and reign. Why? Because your reign is just, and your reign is good. And there's coming a day, right? There's a day when Jesus Christ will return, and he will sit upon the throne, and he will deal with all sin and all unrighteousness, and he'll set up his righteous kingdom. This is what we long for. And so we pray for this. Come, Lord Jesus, for you shall inherit all the nations. That's the, that's the end game, right? God's the creator of all things, and in the end, it's all his. It's all his. Now, I've been thinking through this psalm. That really, yeah, I, I told you, I don't, I'm not necessarily walking straight through these. We're just kind of picking and choosing. And the reason that I really wanted to come to Psalm 82 was, was verses 3 and 4. Yeah, as I read that, those just stood out in my mind again and again and again. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Those verses have been ringing in my ears. And I I ask myself the question, how do we respond? How do we respond to the reality that we have a God who is just? How do we respond to the injustice that we see in the world around us? Because there's no doubt that we live in a world where power is abused and the weak and the poor and the needy are taken advantage of how do we respond well i mean number one we see it here right we pray that's what asaph does in light of who god is we pray we pray for god's reign we pray for god's rule we pray for god's justice now now and to come i think we particularly in light of psalm 82 this is a psalm that's directed towards leaders and leadership and government. We should pray for our government, right? We should pray for our rulers. You know, First, first Timothy 2, right? We pray for all kings and all in authority. It, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we see the, we see the parallel, right, between, between what's taking place and within our own nation and even within the church. And, and, and so, yes, we pray. But we, desperately, we pray for our government. We pray for our leadership because we, there's no question that we have an, a corrupt government, right, that abuses the poor and takes advantage of the weak and the needy. Yes? So we pray. We pray... We pray for our current leadership. We, we pray for corruption to cease. We, we pray for the implement, you know, the implement, ugh, my tongue is tied, implementation of just legislation, right? I mean, we've been praying, right, about this whole Planned Parenthood issue. And we must, we should. We should do everything we can to see that justice is done for the unborn, We pray that God would put just rulers in office. These are things we should pray for. We we pray for the poor. We live in a world that is starving. That's hard for us to grasp because our cupboards are full. But the reality is is that there there are millions of people around the world who do not have enough food for the day, for this day, who will go hungry. And we pray. We pray for provision of food. We pray for medical provision for children and for adults who are suffering and dying from preventable diseases. They just need the resources. We pray for those who have been removed from their homes. We pray for, we pray for the fatherless, the orphans. We, we pray that God would raise up 
adoptive parents, foster parents. And I know this is obviously near and dear to my own heart, but that needs to come from the church. Where do we want them to go? We want them to go where they're going to hear the word. We want them to go where they're going to know Jesus, and so that means the church is going to have to stand in the gap. We pray for their parents. We pray that 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 generational curse would be broken. We pray for the unborn. We pray that we would see this murder end. We pray pray for the persecuted. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are daily living, wondering if today will be their last day. We pray for their persecutors. That they will see the light of Jesus Christ through through those they are harming. Much like the Apostle Paul, as he stood by as Timothy was, or Stephen was martyred. We pray for those who are enslaved, the millions who are involved in sex trafficking and work, labor. We live in a world that is corrupt, where children and women are abused and used and killed. And so we pray. We pray for the unreached. (laughs) for those who have no access to the gospel. You know, God has not called us to sit back and do nothing. I I think you see that as we look at the word. We, We must pray, but we don't just pray. You know, listen to Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. God doesn't call us, yes, we pray. We pray for all of these needs, but we move as the people of God to meet needs, to fight injustice, to show mercy to those who need mercy. We do this because that's who we are. That's who we were, right? The poor and the needy, the weak and the abused and afflicted. Brothers and sisters, that's who we are without Christ. We were without strength, ungodly. We desperately needed mercy. And God miraculously showed us his love. And so as his people, we do likewise. We do likewise. And So where we see injustice, we do whatever we can. So that means we pray, but that means we vote, that means we write, that means we call, that means we give sacrificially of our time and our finances and our abilities to meet these needs. That's going to be different for all of us, right? I mean, not everybody can foster children or adopt children. Not everybody can be involved with the Women's Care Center, but you can be involved in different ways. And we must. What we cannot do is nothing. So we have a God who is the judge. And one day we're going to stand before him. And we're going to give an account. Yes, everything will be set right. And we praise the Lord for that. But we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to weigh out. And somehow I don't think that just sitting here and complaining and moaning about the condition of our country and our world is what he has in mind. Let's look to the Lord in prayer tonight.